Education has played a crucial role in the advancement of blacks over the generations and in the lags of blacks behind others in the American economy. In order to understand both the lags and the advancement, it is necessary to understand the extremely low level from which the education of most black Americans began and the very long time before the great majority of blacks had the kind of education that would qualify them for many of the occupations in which education was essential. Racial discrimination barriers kept educated blacks out of some of these occupations, but until perhaps the middle of the 20th century, there were relatively few blacks to be kept out by such barriers. Looked at differently, the dramatic increases in the numbers of blacks in many professional occupations in the last half of the 20th century cannot be attributed solely, or even primarily, to the removal of these barriers by civil rights legislation. The rise of blacks into professional and other high-level occupations was greater in the years preceding passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than in the years following passage of that act. What had happened was a dramatic increase in the numbers of blacks with college and postgraduate education. Prior to the First World War, fewer than 5,000 college degrees had been granted to black students in the entire history of the United States. But by 1935, that had increased fivefold. And by 1947, the black colleges alone granted in one year more degrees than blacks had ever received in all the years prior to the First World War. Increases in the numbers of doctorates received by blacks were also dramatic. Similarly, despite a widespread tendency to see the rise of blacks out of poverty as due to the civil rights movement and government social programs of the 1960s, in reality, the rise of blacks out of poverty was greater in the two decades preceding 1960 than in the decades that followed. Education was a major factor in this as well. As of 1940, Non-white males averaged just 5.4 years of schooling, compared to 8.7 for white males. Over the next two decades, the absolute amount of education increased for both, and the gap between them narrowed. In 1940, the difference in schooling between black and white young adult males, aged 25 to 29, was four years. But by 1960, that had shrunk to less than two years. Because this was an era of massive black migration out of the South, this quantitative narrowing of the gap in schooling may well have been accompanied by a qualitative improvement, as many blacks left behind the low-quality schools in the Jim Crow South. How did this translate into economic change? As of 1940, more than four-fifths of black families, 87% in fact, lived below the official poverty level. By 1960, this had fallen to 47%. In other words, the poverty rate among blacks had been nearly cut in half before either the Civil Rights Revolution or the Great Society social programs began in the 1960s. The continuation of this trend can hardly be automatically credited to these political developments, though such claims are often made, usually ignoring the pre-existing trends whose momentum could hardly have been expected to stop in the absence of such legislation. By 1970, the poverty rate among blacks had fallen to 30 percent, a welcome development, but by no means unprecedented. A decade after that, with the rise of affirmative action in the intervening years, the poverty rate among black families had fallen to 29 percent. Even if one attributes all of this 1 percent decline to government policy, it does not compare to the dramatic declines in poverty among blacks when the only major change was the rise in their education. Whatever the merits of various movements and programs on other grounds, the claim that they were the primary factor in the economic advancement of blacks cannot be squared with the facts. Yet a whole generation of black leaders, intellectuals, and activists have become committed to such movements and programs and their accompanying rhetoric. However, Frederick Douglass warned, as far back as the 1870s, that blacks should cultivate their brains more and their lungs less. While no one can deny the existence of racial discrimination in employment, housing, and other areas, the assumption that the magnitude of employment discrimination can be measured by relative numbers of blacks in particular occupations ignores the huge quantitative and qualitative differences in education between blacks and whites which existed in past generations, often as a result of government discrimination in the provision of educational resources.
Without an understanding of the reasons for both the lags and the progress of blacks in the past, policy prescriptions for future advancement risk misplaced emphases. More specifically, it risks underestimating the importance of the quantity and quality of education, which depends upon both students and teachers, and much less on the amount of money fed into education bureaucracies or on the fads and panaceas that come and go in the schools and colleges. While the New England culture that was transplanted into various southern enclaves after the Civil War had remarkable successes, later successful black schools a century later usually had no New England origins, but, like New England, they represented a culture very unlike the black redneck culture. Ralph Ellison has pointed out that such stellar black singers as Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson received their development from an extensive personal contact with European culture, free from the influences which shape Southern Negro personality in the United States. For those who are interested in schools that produce academic success for minority students, there is no lack of examples, past and present. Tragically, there has been an utter lack of interest in academically successful black schools by most educators. Among the few who have even bothered to take notice, too many have been as dogmatic as Kenneth B. Clark, who said that excellence at Dunbar represented the few, that Dunbar is the only example in our history of a separate black school that was able, somehow, to be equal, a result of unique circumstances that could scarcely have existed in any other part of the country. Every one of these unsubstantiated claims was demonstrably untrue. One-third of all the black high school students in Washington were not the few. There were, and are, other black schools that met or exceeded national norms, as examples discussed here have shown. And far from being confined to Washington, they have been found from New England to California. Why this ignoring or dismissal of examples of black educational success? Sometimes, the reason is ideological. Some, like Professor Clark, have a vested interest in the doctrine that separate is inferior, which underpinned the historic Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision, in which his research was cited. To say that mixing and matching racial groups is not a prerequisite for quality education would call into question the decades-long school busing struggle which might then be seen in retrospect as a costly and divisive wild goose chase, and questions might be raised about the current mantra of diversity. Other reasons for ignoring or downplaying successful black schools include the fact that there is no political mileage or financial benefits to be gotten from focusing on such schools, despite how much of an educational goldmine their experience might be for black children. Put bluntly, failure attracts more money than success. Politically, failure becomes a reason to demand more money, smaller classes, and more trendy courses and programs, ranging from black English to bilingualism and self-esteem. Politicians who want to look compassionate and concerned know that voting money for such projects accomplishes that purpose for them, and voting against such programs risks charges of mean-spiritedness, if not implications of racism. Ironically, many of the bitter-end defenders of the current public school system and its educational dogmas are also in favor of preferential admissions of minority students to colleges and universities. In other words, having denied minority children an opportunity to develop the kinds of intellectual skills that would make lower admission standards for them unnecessary, they then send minority students on to institutions where they are less likely to meet course standards designed for better-prepared students and where most minority students do not last long enough to graduate. During their time on campus, such students help present a photogenic picture of diversity on many campuses, but their roles are much like those of movie extras, who simply provide a background for others. Despite many pious expressions of goodwill and hope for improvements in the education of minority students, few are prepared to do what it takes including taking on entrenched vested interests in the schools of education, the teachers' unions, and state, local, and national educational bureaucracies. Even fewer are prepared to challenge black students to work harder and abandon the counterproductive notion that seeking educational excellence is acting white. 
despite the heartening achievements of some black schools, which have repeatedly demonstrated what is possible, even with children from low-income backgrounds, the general picture of the education of black students is bleak. Much of what is said, and not said, about the education of black students reflects the political context rather than the educational facts. Whites walk on eggshells for fear of being called racists, while many blacks are preoccupied with protecting the image of black students, rather than protecting their future by telling the blunt truth. It is understandable that some people are concerned about image, about what in private life might be expressed as, what will the neighbors think? But when your children are dying, you don't worry about what the neighbors think.